Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Jabba, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. Welcome, everybody. It's that time again. It's fueled by Deathcast, and as always, I'm the incredible Jeff, and I'm the incomparable D Man. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I've been using that <laughs> word way too much lately. Um, but uh, welcome, everybody. This is episode twenty. We're almost old enough to drink. Yeah. Oh man, as soon as twenty one hits. Oh, we're partying. Oh man, can't wait. But yeah, <laughs> twenty episodes in. Thank you guys so much for listening and tweeting and resharing and just you know talking about the podcast. As always, we always start the show thanking our friend Brock Powell, BrockFox.com. Go follow him over there. Go follow his stuff that he's doing over at Unpop Entertainment. They're going to come out with a brand new video very soon, which is going to make us all laugh until we cry, I'm sure. Yeah, hell, go follow him at the grocery store until it gets creeped out. Yeah, please, please do. (laughs) He's hard to miss. Um, We have this contest. It's continuing. Uh, you can win a one of a kind rare decanter from Deathwish Coffee and Deneen Pottery. Um, all you got to do is go on over to deathwishcoffee.com backslash deathcast where this podcast lives. Right at the top of that page is all of the ways that you can enter to win. And we're going to pick the winners on the May 4th episode. So it's coming right around the corner. Yeah, it's coming up quick. And if I see these pop up on eBay, I'm haunting you in your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you know, you got a couple, you got a, you got about a week and a half left to, to enter. So, so get on it. And uh, one of those rare decanters could be yours. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. So we're getting closer to camping season now that it's warming up a bit. And as you camp, you might need yourself some hot coffee for the whole trip. And Mm -hmm. what better to hold that than a Stanley Thermos? Yeah. So we're going to do a a, a 20% discount on the Stanley Thermos this week. This ends uh, the... the 26th, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, All the way to to April 26th. All the way to Wednesday. This is going to... This secret code, type in CAMP, C-A-M-P, and you'll get that 20% off. And... I love that thermos. You yeah. know, I use it. I, I think I've said on this podcast before, I, I um, make my morning coffee out of a French press and I just pour it right into the thermos so it stays hot, you know, all day if I, if I don't finish it right then. <laughs> and why burn yourself in the mouth with coffee once a day when you can have it throughout the day and burn your mouth multiple times? Exactly. <laughs> so so get, on that, get on that awesome discount this week. Gah! Science! I heard you were going to scare me this week, Jeff. Yeah, it's a little... It's not scary. I mean, I always think it's not that scary, but then you are terrified. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see. Um, we're going back to space where Shit. things are scary. Shit! Uh, um, uh, what's really neat is when we confirm theories we've had about space and you know with the new technology and the new you know telescopes that we have and and all that kind of stuff that keeps coming out we are confirming a lot of theory things that have only been theories up until this point and this is one of them um a duo of scientists at the university of waterloo in canada have been able to capture the first composite image of a dark matter bridge that actually connects galaxies together now this has been a theory that's been actually around for a very long time that we can observe galaxies even in the naked eye you can observe galaxies in the night sky Mm -hmm. um and it has been thought that everything is interconnected like a gigantic spider web in the universe because it's kind of hard to fathom that there's just nothingness in between galaxies you know like like is there like there's got to be something and that something we we kind of theorized was dark matter. Well, dark da- dark matter is kind of weird. Its name is misleading because it's not actually. We don't know what it. We don't even know if it's matter. It's just something that has a gravitational pull, unlike anything we've ever seen. We don't even know what it is. Well, it's 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 actually something that makes up a quarter of our universe. Yeah, is insane. what dark matter is. Um, some physicists believe it's made up of weakly interacting massive particles, which 
hilariously enough, are called wimps. <laughs> um, and some believe it's all about axions, which is another type of particle. Uh, but um, we, like you said, we're not completely sure about it. But what they did, and this is incredible, they analyzed, these scientists analyzed photos of 23,000 galaxy pairs that are floating 4.5 billion light years away. Now picture, what, what the best way I can explain this to you, D-Man, is, is like take a photo and then overlay another photo on top of it and then another photo on top of it and do that 23,000 times. And because dark matter comes up so faintly on our instruments, but by doing that 23,000 times, we actually got a clear image oh, weird. of this bridge and we'll we'll tweet out a photo of this actually because it's pretty neat it almost looks like an infrared um image between two white hot galaxies and but it's showing that they are connected by dark matter so so this is this is actually completely saying that it is true that galaxies are connected by dark matter i can't get that spider web image out of my head yeah just i the that's insane. It is really cool. Um, the, one of the the uh, one of the the scientists, Michael Hudson, the professor there who was a part of this, said for decades researchers have been predicting the existence of dark matter filaments between galaxies that act like a web-like superstructure connecting galaxies together. And this image moves us beyond predictions to something we can actually see and measure. So now that we actually know how to measure it, we can actually look even farther and see this kind of thing happening in other galaxies. In- between other galaxies, which is really, really cool. Like I, like I said, I love it when a theory becomes reality. Yeah, you know. And uh, so I didn't mean to scare you. No, too much, no. I but- think I, I think I'm good on that one. There, I, I'm not thinking about aliens. I'm not thinking about uh, explosions. I'm thinking about connections now. I think that's kind of cool. It is. It is really, really cool. And uh, um, we've seen that uh, it is actually stronger when the galaxies are 40 million light years away from each other or less. And when they get farther away, the filaments actually get, you know, much thinner. thinner. Yeah. But uh, they're still there. So. Why is it there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Someday we is it, will is unlock. Is it the one thing holding our galaxy together from just like, psh, just blowing apart? I guess. Letting loose? I don't know. One day we're going to unlock the mysteries of dark matter and it's going to be, it's going to be wild. That's intense, man. Yeah. What fuels you? So this week we actually have the for the first time ever two guests, and it was a surprise. Two amazing guests. Yeah, um, Lacey Mackey and Tate Fletcher, um, and you're gonna hear an incredible conversation with the with the pair of them. Uh, we actually Deathwish Coffee actually met them at um, the Coffee and Chocolate Festival last year yeah. through because they because of their company K Man Coffee, mm-hmm. and then you actually met Lacey this year, right, D Man? Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the that company and what they do, and and I don't believe in in competition so far that I, I think you know everybody can work together and totally. play nice. <clears throat> but I've I've actually drawn a lot of inspiration off of these guys even before they had a coffee company. So their lives are so interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, Tate Fletcher being the crazy stuntman actor, a uh, UFC ultimate fighter, crazy guy. The guy who beamed himself with a rock in Westworld. <laughs> I know. Like know, crazy. Right? See, I knew who he, who he was before that. And it, like I saw him there in the pit and I was like, I think that's Tate Fletcher there in the pit. <laughs> and he crawls out of the pit he's like that that's definitely Tate yeah. Fletcher, and then he just brains himself. It's amazing. But yeah, when I, when I heard that they were going to be at the Coffee and Chocolate Festival, I I definitely wanted to be there, and I wanted to talk to them, and I did, and we made this connection, and we made this podcast happen. And in this podcast, we talk about some really interesting stuff. Yeah. And one of the things that that Mister Fletcher brings up is mastering yourself. Yeah, and Lacey talks touches upon this too. It's like the idea that. Don't worry about what other people are doing around you. Worry about what you're doing. Try to be better than you were yesterday. If you think you kicked ass yesterday, kick ass even harder tomorrow. Yeah. You and, know, like And to build upon that like you can't you can't live in the relativity of others. You can't right. keep on comparing yourself to other people cuz inevitably at some point you'll be surrounded by chumps and then you'll be a chump just like that. Yeah. It's it's just the way it works. So, you know, even in those deep pits of hell that life tends to be sometimes that's the most important not to live in relativity you you have to look at yourself and how do you become better 
than you were yesterday. How like do you, you master yourself? Yeah. You know, exactly. And it, and it really comes to the point of so many people get into a rut and they become complacent in where they are at. And we've touched upon this in multiple episodes of this this podcast before, actually. Um, but, you know, and it's, and it's hard sometimes to look past that. But, man, is it inspiring to hear both Tate and Lacey just talk about how multiple times in their lives they just looked at it and were like, you know what, I'm going to try this now and I'm just going to keep pushing forward and keep reinventing myself and re reimagining who I am in the world. And, and you know, you deserve to be better yeah. than you are right now. Totally. You deserve it to yourself to try and be better and you owe it to the universe to be the best that you possibly can be. Yeah. Uh, now we're the army, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, take a look at yourself. You deserve better than what you are today. Right. And you have that ability. So don't cheat yourself. Like, dig in. How can you be better? Go train. Yeah. Do whatever it is. Yeah. You know, read it. Read a book. Learn. Yeah. yeah. Do it. It's all there. It's all at our fingertips, whether it be the internet or the the availability of 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 um, establishments around us to to help us become better. And man, you always got to look at it. What yeah. what can I do? Yeah. You can't be like, well, I worked on this for two years and I'll stay right there. Let it go. Let it go. Drop it. Move Keep on. Going. Keep Get pushing better. forward. That's what fuels us, for sure. This week on the community shout out, uh, somebody. I feel like I feel like I gotta be like a DJ, like community shout out. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, somebody that uh, is in the community, just you know, repping the company, repping our podcast, even though he has his own, Mister Jamie Robinson, Mister Throwback Thursday, Mister Throwback Thursday. If you haven't checked out that podcast, go check it out. It's really, really fun. All your hip hop needs every single week. It's 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 pretty great. I like hip hop. Yeah. Um. But I mean, Jamie Robinson, we see you out there. You know, you're not only talking about your, like I said, your own podcast. You're talking about us, Fueled by Deathcast. You're talking about Deathwish Coffee all the time. You're sharing the stuff. You're you're interacting with the community, and uh, you make you make us all smile. Yeah, I love seeing, like you said, the the interaction with community. I love seeing everybody working together to make a a better place to be constantly yeah. and i think i think that's really cool and i think i think the the community itself is always trying to better itself totally. and i think that's really important cuz i mean we we can create something really special here and it's 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 because we have all of these individuals like Jamie Robinson to to kind of uphold this awesome thing that we have going yeah. on here so hats off to you mugs up to mugs you thank up. you thank you very much jamie, jamie robinson for for supporting us and everything that you do man speaking of coffee communities d-man you're going on a trip this week actually actually as this episode airs you're gonna probably be like landing i think uh no i'll no? be taking off when this episode uh, oh, airs. okay yeah and you're be, going to seattle right yeah, i'm going to the sca the specialty coffee Association. Awesome. And if I got that wrong, deal with it. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. Yeah. So it's pretty much a convention of all these really, I mean, I, I'm kind of speaking out of my ass a little bit here because I haven't gone. And yeah. that's why I wanted to go. But it's it's pretty much all the awesome things that coffee is down to one convention, whether it be the 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 next technology for brewing or, or you know. Barista technology. Yeah, barista or... technology up the wazoo. And the 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 good thing for me is I get to see all the people that I've been working with just through email. So uh, Deathwish works with a lot of different vendors to either get our bags or anything that yeah. we use here, <clears throat> even down to the to the green coffee that we order to roast. And all these guys are going to be there selling their wares. And yep. uh, um, Eric Donovan and I will be walking the floor yeah. representing the company. And I'm really looking forward to it, man. And I know other coffee companies are going to be there. In fact, guest on this show this week, Lacey Mackey from Caveman Coffee. You guys should be hooking up uh, as well when you go out there, hopefully. Like, hopefully. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's a great community. We love the coffee community. Um, and uh, I can't wait to hear all about it. Hopefully, yeah. uh, next week's episode, you can tell us all about your, I'm, I'm your gonna, adventure. I'm going to give a little preview. I'm, I'm after something. Okay, what are you after? I'm after a grinder. Ah, nice. And there's obviously going to be like companies that deal in coffee grinders out there. So. Yeah, and I want to find a good one for a good price that we can we can then turn around to our customers and offer. I want to I want it to be a Deathwish special grinder. It uses Ooh. uses dinosaur bones to grind Ooh, up your coffee. I beans. love Something this. like that. You know, I want I want to get fancy with it, but uh 
I don't know. I just feel like that's something that that is missing on our website. We used to have the hand grinders. I wasn't a big fan of those. Yeah. Uh, there are hand grinders that work good out there. That one works okay, but you know, this is th- this is one of my. Hey, main you got missions. a goal, so hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully you'll you'll achieve that mission. Like I said, we'll we'll hear all about your adventures next week. I can't wait. The Death Wish Death List. This week, actually, just shy of last week, we lost um, Charlie Murphy. He was only 57 years old. He was an actor, comedian, and writer. You probably know his famous brother, Eddie. I mean, but Charlie was famous in his own right. Uh, He found fame, as of late, obviously, on The Chappelle Show with the true Hollywood stories of Charlie Murphy where he hilariously told misadventures, you know, being in Eddie's entourage with Prince and Rick James and all that stuff. What did five figures say to the face? (laughs) Slap! (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, but he had a pretty incredible life. He was a tra- he was a transit police officer and a boiler tech in the Navy, um, and this was all after he got out of jail because he spent some time in jail as an adolescent. What do you do? Um, what adolescents do? You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I played in trees, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also worked with the hip hop group K Nine Posse in the late eighties and the early nineties. He was actually credited at as an as an executive producer and songwriter on a few of those tracks. Um, Some of his first roles in movies were bit parts in uh, iconic movies like Harlem Nights and Mo Better Blues. He got his first breakout role, though, in CB4. He was one of the antagonists in that movie. Um, He also worked a ton of television, including the the aforementioned Chappelle show. He voiced uh, characters on um, animated TV shows like The Boondocks and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He even came out with his own stand-up special on Comedy Central in 2010. And here's the thing about Charlie Murphy that I I feel like stood out to me. Uh, Comedy is a very hard thing to get into. Yeah. And this dude just jumped right in. Yeah. Just just feature or uh, headlining his own... uh, comedy tour when he hasn't really done comedy before right. and he nailed it man yeah he was really really funny he was also an accomplished writer um he was the storyboard and screenwriter of vampire in brooklyn norbit and paper soldiers and paper soldiers he actually uh had a a minor role in as well um and he unfortunately uh, succumbed to leukemia this past week uh so our thoughts go out to eddie's family eddie and the, and the entire murphy family and also um his kids who he leaves behind. Uh, Death wish you a happy birthday this week. Uh, The day this comes out, Thursday, April 20th, to Mike Portnoy. He's going to be 50. He is one of my favorite drummers of all time. If you don't know who he is, you definitely know the band. He co-founded Dream Theater. He also drummed for Avenge Sevenfold for a while after he left Dream Theater. So he's been all over the place. In fact, I think he's got like four bands now. I'm not surprised. He is so busy and so awesome. Also, uh, Thursday, April 20th, uh, internet darling George Takai, also mm. um, Sulu from the original Star Trek there. Wow, he looks damn good for being 80. He's turning 80 years old. Yeah, he does. Uh, Friday, April 21st, I felt it uh, appropriate because Death Wish Coffee just got back from their trip to London. We want to wish a happy birthday to Her Majesty the Queen. She's going to be 91 years That's old. Crazy. The longest reigning monarch of the British Empire, which is pretty crazy. And on Saturday, April 22nd, Negan himself from The Walking Dead, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, is going to be 51. So happy birthday to all of them. And uh, we're going to take a short break like we always do and give you uh, this week's D-Man Death Wish update. Man's Death Wish Update, brought to you by Death Wish Coffee. So we got a pretty exciting week this week, D-Man. Yeah, got a got a few things going on. Yeah. So we're starting a new and cool campaign called Grind It Out, and we'll be talking a lot more about it later. But just to talk a little bit about it now, it's pretty much shining the light back on the people who drink our coffee. I mean, we have had such an amazing ride since the Super Bowl. And it seems like the conversation has just been on us yeah. since then. But we want to really spotlight how Death Wish Coffee lives day to day. Yeah, and we're not talking about like celebrities or influencers or 
people who have the most Twitter followers. We're talking about the people who are actually grinding it out day to day, doing the thing that it takes a lot of work to do and we're the coffee to help them out. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of focusing on that a little bit. So I'm really cool. We'll be releasing a lot of cool, like it's almost like a documentary type interviews where we're, dig- yeah. where we're digging into to what these people do and how they do it and why they do it. And we're going to have a lot of interaction on our different social media platforms, a lot of different cool blogs and videos and, and um, you know, uh, posting and stuff. So so be watching all that. Hashtag grind it out. Everything that you do in the day and you can be part of the conversation. Yeah. Also, as you're listening to my very voice mm. right now, we are giving away a Death Wish lanyard. All right. And we talked about it a little bit before, but uh, it's actually being released now. So you will get a free Death Wish lanyard with, with every purchase. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love having the lanyards all the time because, you know, I go to a lot of shows, I go to a lot of conventions, and they just they just work great. Yeah, you can keep your keys on it or, or you can, you know, use it for any certain name badge that you might have for yeah. any, I don't know, even a crappy born like business convention you can yeah. wear one of those but. yeah but you know you can rock death wish while you're doing it so. hell yeah. yeah so so those are being released or are released and you can get one right now yeah. um and that'll be going on for a little while probably until we run out of them so yeah. it might last a couple of days who knows get your order in though i've got some big news jeff oh i love big news i might get in trouble for saying this Jeff. oh <laughs> i love it when you get in trouble d-man <laughs> <laughs> How many times are they going to have to sit me down in a room and be like, dude, you can't be telling people everything, man. I don't know. Once a day, maybe? Once a day, maybe. <laughs> this is a really cool one, though. Um, hey, we're releasing our cold brew. Uh, we've been teasing it. We yeah. definitely have been teasing it. So as I'm speaking to you right now, and it's it's being shipped to, awesome. to our fulfillment center to get it out to you guys. It's being packaged in the boxes and next week you will be able to purchase this there it is and if you haven't seen the video that uh d-man and myself released last week we went over to old saratoga where they were canning it up and uh, we got to try it right off the line and god like i like i said in that video if you haven't seen it go on over to youtube and check out that video um but uh i say it in the video too that the last batch that we did was really good But this batch blows it out of the water. So anybody who got to try the last batch and maybe wasn't as happy with with the taste of it, you're going to be so surprised with this batch. And anybody who didn't get a chance to try it, you're just going to get heaven in your mouth. Yeah, that's... Uh, close your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it is really good, though. Yeah, we we pretty much... we We're not going to be happy unless we're competing with the top or we are the top. Yeah. So... We we compared our cold brew against all other cold brews, and man, if this doesn't match up, it blows everything else out of the water, and we really nailed down what Death Wish Coffee is. I can't wait to see how everybody likes it, man. It's going to awesome. be great. Awesome. And well, you know, I'm going to stop you right there, D-Man. Let's <laughs> save some of the rest of the stuff for next week. I've gotten myself in enough trouble as it is. Yeah. <laughs> we now return to Fueled by Deathcast. This week is really exciting because we got to do two guests at once. Yeah, and two amazing guests yeah, at once. It yeah. wasn't like two guests for the price of one. Right, right. <laughs> uh, Lacey Mackey and Tate Fletcher. Yeah. And yeah. they are both so incredibly inspiring. Yeah. Really, really inspiring. I, I, I was so happy to be able to talk to them and just hear their different outlooks on life and where it's led them both to now be the co-founders of caveman coffee yeah Coffee. and tate's one of those guys i've been following for a really long time and is definitely a part of the reason why i'm sitting here in this room not only podcasting but podcasting for an awesome coffee company yeah um he, the dude is a podcasting monster i mean if you haven't checked his podcast out pirate life radio it is really top notch. And Lacey has an awesome podcast called the Grown Ass Women's Coffee Club. And they both are podcasters. And in fact, um, if you, another shameless plug for Tate, if you go on over to Pirate Life Radio and listen to episode 93, at the end of this episode that we talked to Tate, he actually announces that he's going to do a stand up comedy <laughs> routine. And we have a good time talking about it. And then he replays that on his episode 93 of Pirate Life Radio. Yeah. So you can kind of bookend it by listening to our podcast and then go on over and listen to his. So these guys were 
definitely on my short list of people that I, I needed to have on this podcast. And I was so glad to make this connection. I can't believe everybody tries to distract us while we podcast all day. It's, I know. It's, it's, it's really amazing. But it's you know great. what? It's not going to stop me. Not ever. Ever. And uh, make sure you enjoy this, guys. I was really happy to do this. So I, I, I hope you enjoy it at least half as much as I did. Yeah. Tate Fletcher and Lacey Mackey. The Fueled by Death Guest. First and foremost, we want to really start, now that we have both of you on, uh, we really want to start just talking about Caveman Coffee because everybody's going to ask us, what the hell are we doing with a different co- coffee company on our podcast? But we love you guys. Um, and we, and we want to know like uh, a little bit about, for our listeners, a little bit about Caveman Coffee and its origins. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm, my response to that too would be that like everyone drinks coffee, there's a lot of coffee to go around and uh you know there's a million coffee companies out there so i don't really see a lot of people as competition as opposed to just people doing cool things reaching different markets um you know all that jazz oh yeah us too that's that's the best attitude to have in this business of course yeah so so caveman's a single origin coffee company we work with a couple farms in colombia brazil and ethiopia um, we do all roast to order. We're mostly an online company. We've gotten a little bit into wholesale and grocery at this point, but predominantly our focus on our um, fan base and our customer base that orders from us online. And then we ship out um, roast to order stuff. Uh, we do a subscription service and a couple things uh, of that nature. We make other products that are paleo related, so like a primal or paleo diet, um, things that would be like non-inflammatory, like creams and and stuff, which are normally inflammatory. We replace with things that are like coconut MCT oil. We have a a non-dairy coconut creamer now that's MCT based, um, Mm -hmm. things like that that pair with coffee, but also add a nutritional aspect to performance and using fuel as performance. Awesome. That, that's, that's a lot of awesome stuff. I would say that that's probably like where of the market we're in and that's what like differentiates us in the coffee world a little bit when did the company uh start uh the end of 2013 we um we i mean tate really you want to talk about your like twitter uh twitter interactions with single origin people um yeah i I don't know that as a company we started in the fall i think Uh uh-huh um and maybe a, a year or so before that, I uh, got really into butter coffee nutrition. I started looking at different ways to have, you know, nutrition be implemented in your body as a, a like l- looking at how to be with fuel for your body instead of filler, you know. And and coffee became a big part of that for me. And I guess I started really going through an experiment uh, with ketogenesis and my body and coconut oil was a, a big uh, nutrient aspect at that time and I would just find single origin coffee and I would use butter and, and coconut oil and scoop it in a Nelgeen bottle and shake it up and I would go off the set. I was in Louisiana on a film called Two Guns and um, I was out there for a couple months I guess and I got, I don't know, as shredded as I'd ever been and I, I thought, man, I've got to be like 216 pounds or so I was I'm pretty sensitive about my weight like I know kind of what it looks like um in different Mm. spots like a fight camp or something like that because I used to cut weight I used to fight MMA and and I so I had a real good idea of what that was like and when I got on the scale two months later I was like I don't know 240 pounds or something like that I was bigger than I'd ever been and and uh at this kind of just shredded capacity and and that kind of sold me on ketogenesis and, and being in the ketogenic state a lot. And the coffee started going to that because I was looking at like, uh, I was just always a fan of coffee. I'd kind of fallen in love with it. And I think that you elevate that conversation with whatever you fall in love with and nurture it. And it, you know, you get to be more refined in your taste for that. And, and that's kind of where I went with coffee. I became a nerd about it a little bit <laughs> and talk about it. And then guys would text me or they would tweet me, um, on Twitter and say, oh, I love this single estate coffee that I have uh, out of Ohio. And, and like we would, they would send me coffee and then I would send them stuff from Ohori's or from wherever I happened to be that my favorite single origin was. And I had like a little coffee club that went back and forth. And then um, Lacey was on and off 
uh, I don't know, maybe it was, what was that dead movie, the movie where he dies all the time? Anyway, she was off and on on some movie and she was, the, she the, was, the edge of tomorrow. Yeah, that's it. That was it, yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> she's, she's I love great. that movie. <laughs> and I think that's what it was at that time. Yeah, it was. I, I can't talk about that one really, but um, uh, just from an NDA standpoint. Right. But um, but yes, was on that and was working like really long film hours um, and, and doing the same thing where anyone that like encounters shift work is going to run into that if you're trying to work 12 to 16 hours a day, you're not sleeping that much. Um, your turnaround times aren't that great. And then you're also having to eat like whatever's available. Like you're not going to last very long and for sure your fitness and your health and, and your overall, everything is going to start to fade. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that was like a totally groundbreaking thing because I could have like more fats in the morning and, and, continue to have like some fats throughout the day and never get into the place where I'm like depleted of sugar, hangry, angry, going to murder somebody if I don't <laughs> eat something and just like eat whatever. I could actually just like, you know, have a pretty mild uh, day, feel good the whole time, lots of energy, really good mental clarity, not super tired, um, not eating things that are going to make me super tired, not getting too full to where I'm going to be like lethargic and just able to like maintain this like am amazing um, energy and feeling throughout the day. And then also what comes with that is that you're kind of doing like an intermittent fasting. So even though I'm not getting in like the same amount of training or workouts that I'd like normally do if I was in my normal like sleep schedule and stuff, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing, um, a huge like increase in body fat or a real depletion of myself. So that was like a huge deal for me. That's pretty uh, much what brought me to to buttered coffee was just I didn't have time in the morning to uh, eat a, a whole breakfast or whatever. And then later on in the middle of the day when, I, when I'm really busy, I didn't have, to have time to eat still. So it just became this way to just kind of supplement uh, breakfast. But then I, I, I started to notice improvements on my body and, and my, my brain. And so for our listeners, they might, they might not be too well versed in how how a uh, you know mct oil works with caffeine would you be able to fill us in a little bit on that absolutely um so like the ingredients that are pretty uh, normal and you can add a bunch of different things to it whatever you want really uh in in a butter coffee um or a paleo latte we like to call it but yeah, i like that yeah uh, you can you you're eliminating the dairy for a couple reasons there's a lot of sugar in dairy Dairy is processed in, in different ways and can have like lactose um, responses in people's bodies, can be very inflammatory to some people, things like that. So if you're cutting that out, then um, you want to add something to make your coffee delicious and creamy. There are a couple things you can add. Uh, butter, uh, grass from grass-fed cows is one. We want it to be grass-fed because you're going to get more omega-3s than omega-6s. We have too many omega-6s in our diet already, so we're trying to increase the omega-3s um, in our body for a better balance of omega complex. And then uh, you would add coconut oil or MCT oil. This is another form of fat. So basically, you're adding two fats to replace you know, uh, another fat that would be milk. Um, and if you are doing this the best way and eliminating sugars and other like complex carbohydrates from your diet, then you're going to actually run your energy and your brain and everything off of this fat. And, um, what's the benefit to doing that? Well, your body stores, um, sugar that it doesn't use and it, it doesn't go through and we all eat, you know, too much of it. And that's how we get fat. We add fat to our body because it's storing, it's, it's uh, basically like turning that sugar into stores for later on when you need it in case you were, you know, in the, in the wilderness and you weren't able to hunt your stuff. But we really don't have that problem anymore. So then um, fats are going to be used as your body if you teach your body correctly to do so as energy and fuel for your brain. But the MCTs, medium chain fats, are not going to be stored on your body as fat. So you're, it's a use it or lose it situation. So uh, whatever you do need, your body's going to absorb or whatever it's able to absorb. And there is some training of that that you have to do by, you know, 
committing to this diet. Um, and then you'll be able to have the energy that you need without having, you know, residual effects of stored fats, as well as, um, the drop in glucose that happens when you run out of sugar and your body doesn't know how to access fat. And then you get that hangry feeling. And I think we all know what that feels like, which is all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Not (laughs) awesome. That's kind of like why and what. And the the, the training of it is like, it's not like, uh, it's something anybody can do and it literally takes zero effort. It just takes discipline. And what that is, is your body will either burn sugar or you'll burn fat for fuel. And it's very much a catchphrase marketing wise in any health and fitness magazine, or if you're uh, one of those very high level online uh, fitness coaches that you see out there with the dirty bathroom mirrors and the flip phone. (laughs) And you you hear people talk about that kind of stuff. And what that looks like is that you need to be sugar deficient for about three days solid before you'll feel really good. But if you eat a high fat diet, fat is sating. It's a satiating uh, quality that it has to it. And once you make that switch over, your body will start to burn adipose tissue in the absence of any carbohydrates or exogenous fats. Now, once you start eating a lot of exogenous fats, your body burns that. Then if you go into intermittent fasting and do that, which becomes an easy thing, your body just burns the adipose tissue stores. And that's what I was experiencing in New Orleans during that time uh, when I got when I just lost all that body fat. Right. And, uh, and so that, that's like it's a simple mechanism that you can look into uh, ketogenic diets or you can look into intermittent fasting. There's a lot of different things out there that, that speak to that. Um, and, and the way, the way that we started was, was really the, like what got me interested in it is also being beset with depression kind of my whole life and, and moodiness and all that. And when I changed my diet, man, I didn't know that I had been eating myself into those situations. Like if you're in a shit mood or you are a crusty person most of the time, you're probably the actions that you're taking to nourish yourself, whether that's physically, spiritually, emotionally, the people you surround yourself with. Uh, it's probably poisonous on all levels. And so I, I just started looking at my own life and going, you know, how do I nourish myself in on these different aspects of my humanity to the best degree? And, and, and what I listen to, what I watch, who I'm around, all that impacts that greatly. But the biggest thing that I have that, that changes the sway of my body is what I eat. And most people um, don't see it that way. We're really taught and given uh, perspective in this world that our bodies are broken in some way. I mean, people talk about depression. They say that's a chemical imbalance, and they will give that diagnosis without doing one test on you. They will talk to a 13-year-old with a 13-year-old's mind, and they will say, "You're well, you're uh, chemically imbalanced. While there's been no testing of any chemicals to see what their balance is. It's an asinine uh, endeavor meant to get you on drugs by pharmaceutical companies. And there's a big push in the FDA. I mean, uh, Obama introduced uh, uh, the head of Monsanto to the head of the FDA. Right. I mean, it's like there's in such collusion everywhere throughout it. And, and now what, what, what's happening with, with Trump is even worse. So from the top down, we're getting messages that are going to create damage, cancer, it, dis-ease, and disease across our whole country. And so that's kind of where, where we started this whole thing from was, you know, we we're just people trying to get our lives better. And uh, then when Lacey was off that movie for a minute, uh, we started a, a little coffee truck, a little butter coffee truck. And we took it to like Brick CrossFit and took it to a couple events here and there. And it was a horrible, horrible failure in all the ways that you could mark a failure. <laughs> and and it was the beginning of what was one of the best things that happened. I mean, so I, I it, it's taught me a lot too in that like the things that I think of as failure and success are are just temporal. And in the broad scheme of things, they're sometimes my greatest assets, you know? Definitely. And so uh, then we got with Keith and Keith is a big coffee nerd too. And he met these roasters that had uh, fled Columbia um, after multiple kidnapping attempts during the Pablo Escobar days. And um, they were at a coffee and chocolate festival and we all got together and had coffee and we're like, whoa, I got to share this with all my nerds on Twitter. And then uh, Lacey started playing around with a, a web page and accidentally published it. And then we were live. And 
We had like 207 I mean, that's orders. That's basically it, right? Yeah, for sure. It was like near um, near like Black Friday weekend in 2013, and and that went live, and we got a bunch of orders, and we were like, oh great, we don't we have a logo, but we don't have like labels, we didn't have anything, so we like printed out labels on an Avery printer thing on my mom's home computer. <laughs> We, I think Keith actually bagged most of the coffee by hand with a little scale, um, and we hand wrote all the shipping labels and d- went through that whole um, debacle of uh, dealing with the post office and learning how to do shipping and stuff in a bulk manner. Um, and we outgrew our website really quickly. We had a, it was a big, big cartel website, but it could only handle a hundred orders at a time and. As we got more than a hundred orders before, the, it would have to you'd have to like process the orders before new orders came in because you would lose the old orders if it got oh, like. Yeah, it sounds a lot like how like a lot yeah. of the growing pains that we dealt with. That's and it's it's pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear about what happened after that Super Bowl commercial. Too. Uh, well, it, let me tell you, <laughs> uh, it was pretty much the same thing where uh, anything that you could imagine uh, would go wrong did go wrong. Yeah. And, we we had a I mean obviously we had a flood of orders come in and we were working with some third party roasters and one of them completely did not deliver on anything that they promised us so we were stuck with pretty much dealing with all the orders on our end and having right. to like take care of this mass of of buys and and not lose this huge customer base that we could potentially have you know that 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 commercial could have sank us if if we weren't ready if we if we weren't able to deal with it. But I feel like that's just the the growing pains of any good business. You're gonna deal with you're just gonna deal with the shit. That's just the way it is. You learn a lot from those things and you learn about how to get better. And I think you find mentors and you find other companies that like have done that before. Obviously we're not like inventing anything here uh with a lot of stuff, but we are inventing this, or we are taking this product to this market in this way for the first time, you know, um, then it's been done. And so, uh, you know, you learn from other people that you admire and that are doing a good job in the spaces and and you figure things out eventually. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, as a small company, obviously I'm sure you guys experience the same thing. And it's just about like, um, inventory control, which is, uh, a challenge, especially with a product that, um, isn't necessarily perishable, but you want it to be as fresh as possible. So yeah. we stick to the like roast to order strategy, which makes it real hard when we get, you know, big orders in um, to manage that. But so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> I- I- inventory is a tricky thing. That's actually what I do here at Death Wish. But um, yeah, especially dealing with Amazon, who has like multiple warehouses all over the nation. And you're dealing yeah. with it with a thing that you want to stay fresh. And and if you're running out of coffee really quick, it's really it's really hard to find that balance. Mm-hmm. Now, you guys must have dealt with quite a uh, grow in business when you became uh, sponsors of the Joe Rogan podcast. And uh, how, how did you guys deal with that influx? I mean, it's been, um, it's, always, it's always been slow and steady. I don't know that that there wasn't like, a, it wasn't like a, a, a flash, at like, like the Super Bowl thing for you guys. It's, it's just like Joe, it, it was nothing that Joe wasn't already talking about. And, um, true. And then when I was on, I mean, so it's like, we've, I mean, that, that momentum has been created by all of our lives and connections up till now, you know, and, and our voice as authentic, trustworthy people. I mean, we're a brand that you can trust, you know, and people know that about us. And, you know, Keith and I kind of being in the public for a while and then, and uh, with the background that Lacey has in marketing and then what she's been doing and all her double secret shit that she, uh, <laughs> Stay online, but uh, <laughs> it's like it's we've got um, you know we we've been loved by people you know I mean our, our, all of our old teammates post about us at Jackson's gym, um, whoever we meet in film like they lo- they are instant advocates. It's like so I think the thing is is like we didn't try to have a business. You know, there's a lot of people that go and they go, oh, the coffee would be a good business. We want to. We never ever I don't think ever had that discussion ever. Like it wasn't a thing where it was like that, that was the goal of it or anything like that. Right. We'd all built pretty vibrant, fantastic lives. And this was something that we loved. And then we're like, oh, well, let's bring this to other people. And it was kind of more of a service oriented 
deal and something that was fun to do together than it was to be a business. And then lo and behold, fuck, we've got a business and we've got to become good stewards of that. And like, who's going to do what? How are we going to learn how to do this? And, and, um, it's really only been to the greatness of Lacey Mackey that it's, uh, not dead and in the ground, but like it, it's, uh, it, that became, that was so, so much of an afterthought for, for all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, what we've tried to do is like live our lives fully out loud. People know what my dog looks like, who, who mom is. They, like my life is pretty open and, and people are like, wow, that dude does a lot of, you know, I'm just a participant in life. And this is just one of the things I get to participate in. And what I hope happens is that it shows a bunch of younger people out there that, wow, you can participate in all that shit. Like you can do absolutely what you want. And it all is contingent on you being in love with the thing that you're doing. And that's the right way to live through life. And most people fuck that up yeah. and they make allowances and, and they, they go, I've got to trade this off uh, my security for this and that. And like, I, I just have never trusted that I'd have security ever in my whole life. So I was free in a way from that, you know, mm -hmm. I feel and, like uh, a lot of the interviews that we've had with, with all these inspirational people that we get to talk to, uh, a lot of them feel that, uh, you know, because they've had experienced something amazing and life changing, that it's their duty to kind of spread the word and and help other people understand this amazing thing that they've discovered. Is that something that you, that you relate to? Yeah, I guess to some degree. I mean, I, I've been my own guinea pig. You know what I mean? I, I love the way uh, when, when I got abreast of what Tim Ferriss is. It's weird because there's a bunch of people that are doing that exact. There, I mean, not a bunch, but there's a few of us that are doing that exact thing. And then there's a bunch of people that are like, I want to make some money on this. How, how do I get into this business? How yeah. do I get into that? You know, and then there's 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 a, a, a few guys that are like, man, I just experiment on myself to see uh, what's going to happen and and how this how can I pull this off? And for me, it's a lot of like it's like fighting in some ways. In that uh, you put yourself in a awkward position and see how you fare there. What what self it is you're protecting? How you can bring your training into real life? How you can uh, start to administer flow states into your life in all facets of your life? You know, most people's lives they look at and they're I'm doing this mundane shit. It's not a flow state. Well, I, I, I would I would offer that perhaps it's super fucking important that you try to create that kind of a consequential living with intention so that you can understand what the fruits of life are really about, which are living in that flow state. And I think that that's the thing. I mean, and I think there's a lot of people that give lip service to some stuff, but they don't have any of that kind of authenticity. People are like that doesn't even sound right. That sounds like hokum. You know, and then when when you talk about it and when you talk to guys that know about it, you're like, holy fuck, maybe me too. And that's magic. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like anything that isn't authentic doesn't last. And that's one thing that we've discovered here at Death Wish, that if we're not really all about it, it's it's not really gonna it's not really gonna stay in the air. Yeah. Yeah. Um you both had said, uh, you know, that y you both have had incredible careers leading up to Caveman Coffee, and I kind of wanted to touch upon that a little bit. And uh, we, actually, we can start with you, Tate. Um, uh, it is widely known, uh, you know, what you do in your life, um, and you started out, you know, kind of getting into the public eye in MMA. Um, was martial arts and, you know, physical, um, that, kind of, that kind of aspect of life, was that always something in your life, even when you were a kid? Or did that kind of come later on in your life? No, it was later. Yeah, was much later in my twenties. And uh, um, oh, go yeah. on. I I didn't have much of an inspirational life when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what? I looked for I looked for solutions to the mundane aspects of life right away, and and then I started selling drugs right as soon as I was able, and I kind of lived life as a criminal up until my early twenties. What was the tipping point? Hmm. I don't know that there was one. There's a bunch, you know. There's a bunch of stuff that occurs, and 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 I guess truly for me, it's like that. There, there's I, there's a there's an openness that I think that happens with people, um, that ravage themselves, where there's a point when there's a like a moment of clarity, they call it, uh, and you can hear a message maybe that you'd heard a thousand times, but you weren't able to access it for whatever reason, and it makes perfect sense at this time. Uh -huh. I think maybe there was enough of those conversations maybe that I was privy to and and I 
I've been hospitalized and I've been and like removed from, I've been separated from alcohol before, but, um, never for, oh, never, I, I never knew I had a problem. Like it sounds funny it says hospitalized for alcoholism, never knew I had a problem. What, when I, when I, when I drank again later and I ended up overdosed again, like a week and a half later, I was sure that I had a problem and that I had to address it, I guess. And, and like, I don't, and I don't know, I, I guess, I, you know, I think that humans live through negative paths a lot and you go down that negative path enough and then you go, oh, fuck, this is the wrong way. I better go somewhere else. But right. it's not like anybody could tell you that's the wrong way. You're not interested in that because it feels good at the time. Right. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of that. And so after you, the, the, the lie comes up, I think, for alcoholics that you get into a position where you go, it'll be different this next time and things are going to be okay and I'm going to control it X, Y, and Z ways or whatever the deal is. And I think that that's, uh, I mean, it, it's important to find that out, to find out whether that's true or not. But after you've gone down that road enough and beaten it up, you know that you've got to go a different way. And then you go, no matter what happens, I end up on the same shitty road and I fucking hate this fucking road and I'm fucking on the road anyway. You pick a different road. And mm -hmm. then you go, I have to be true to this road and I'm going to see where this goes. And I, I, I don't know. I, th I think there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. I mean, if I had a answer for you we would we would uh, be having this conversation on a yacht somewhere probably <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you definitely you know looked at your life and you, you 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 changed it around you became a force in nature in mma and then um you know like if you've talked about too you you switch tracks again and got into the acting side of it um you mentioned uh the movie two guns that you were a part of which was awesome i know um i, I mean everybody john knows wick. john wick yeah. and uh west, know, west world, world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah um how did that kind of come into your life like was did you actively look for that you know after mma or or did you that kind of just was that another like organic kind of road shift for you it was it was all organic I had first done a film in 2000 and then I never really thought about it again. I was working at a nightclub and, and I was doing that and I was satisfied with that at the time. I'd started fighting at that time around that same time. I was doing a bunch of uh, amateur tournaments uh -huh. um, around the world. And so I didn't start looking at film stuff until like 2009 when I stopped, when I'd had my last fight and I met a guy named Darren Prescott, and Darren was second unit director and stunt coordinator on a film that was called Paul, and he'd come in, and he kind of fell in love with jiu-jitsu, and so we would roll every day, and then after a couple of weeks, he's like, oh, you did a film before, somebody said, and then we started talking, and I'd ended up, I'd, I'd worked for one of his friends 10 years previously. Oh, cool. So, in this thing and then i went into red dawn after that like yep. a month later i go well maybe this is a real thing and i was doing bodyguard jobs and shit and i was like i knew i didn't want to fight anymore because i wanted to fight so much um still <laughs> and i think that, that was dangerous at the time that i was like at that time it was like you know you're only getting more damage for less results and i was like i could maybe fight another five more years but then I knew that whatever the that five years, I was like, well, that'll be five years from when I start the next thing after fighting, and what is that, and what's the risk reward, and right. and all that kind of shit. Now, and, and I was seeing guys, I was seeing friends of mine, man. Uh, Liddell had just left my gym, and he'd gotten knocked out pretty badly, uh, like earlier that month, and and uh, he was still looking to fight because he wanted to make a nut, you know, right. and. And there's a fucking, I, and then I remember when I was a kid seeing Evander Holyfield fighting in a fucking fairgrounds. And I'm like, that's a, what the fuck, man? Right, yeah, right. nobody wants to do that. That's sad. You know? And so there's a thirst and a craving for a combat artist to do his thing that is beyond what anybody can imagine. And you will do it to your own detriment times a million. And I was like, I, and I just, I wore that shit as cautionary tales. And I go, you know, you're going to really, it's going to be, like you're not it was the first time I started thinking of my future self and going, you're not going to do your future self any favors if you don't address this right now, because really it's pushing off the inevitable and it was not being brave enough to have the conversation of who are you now, which I think is one of the most important conversations that a man can have. And one of the fewest conversations that most men ever have. If you get 10 guys around fucking, none of them are going to know what I'm talking about. It'll be like one out of a hundred guys will have really faced up to that question.
Yeah, because it's a, it's an ego decimating question. Yeah, that's a that's an incredible outlook to have, you know, and, and to, to keep that in your back pocket like that. Um, and obviously, then you know this leads to caveman coffee, and I want to like hit the ball over to Lacey now. Um, talking on your career path, I know, and Tate actually um, hit on this a little bit. You, I think, started out in marketing, or at least like that's where you started really cutting your teeth in, in like business, right? Martial artist. Shut up. She was a Shut lifelong up. martial artist. <laughs> well, I, I was going to get there too, but I just wanted to. I wanted to start. What? 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 What came first? Was it the martial arts or was it the marketing? No, I, he's making things up. I did like, <laughs> did like cardio kickboxing class once in high school. <laughs> and the and the the coach like saw me and my girlfriend come in, and he I I could see like that he was looking at us and deciding like what kind of music we'd want to put listen to and we we're both blonde girls so we put on britney spears and we were oh, both no. like oh my god come on dude oh, no. um no i um yeah my background's in marketing I, I started out out of college like working um in the event space and production space um and i worked cause for mtv and like viacom networks and did a bunch of like guerrilla marketing things that involved um finding people to go to different like recorded TV shows and stuff that would happen during the day. So it would be kind of hard to get people to come to them like TRL or um, different top 10 shows. I did a couple of comedy central shows. Um, and so really literally just like the girl uh, who's on the side of the street being like, Hey, jump in my van and come see a TV show. Yeah, kind of don't you guys want to come to a show later? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it wasn't um, above that. And sometimes, sometimes it was a little more glamorous than that. I got to like, I did a show with Greg Giraldo and um, got to travel to a bunch of different like comedy um, clubs and stuff around New York City for a couple months and get people that were fans of comedy to come to specific days, you know, like when Louis C.K. came on, like get all of his fans to come and stuff like that. But we would record on like Tuesday at two, so people would be in work, so you have to talk people into like, you know getting either ditching school or coming to work. The MTV stuff was a little funnier because I'd be sneaking on to like, high school campuses definitely wouldn't fly these days. Oh my uh, goodness. And I was like a, a, a junior high or high school kid and, um, and like handing out tickets and getting, um, at the time there, there were emails, there was no social media. So mm-hmm. we were getting emails and phone numbers. Um, Deeper numbers. Yeah, basically <laughs> like doing a system of, grinding out like going taking all those numbers that we got hundreds of numbers in a day like a team of like 10 people going out scavenging the city to get these like whatever our goal was for that day call all those people it was really before texting was a big thing too because now you could do like a robo text but um we would physically call the people like talk to them we try to touch them three different times times in a conversation and then we'd have uh 50 of the people like show up um wow. so it was this whole formula, but that really trained me in like, like, you know, face to face marketing and like how to go out and find the target, the, the right people that are going to actually show up and like, um, really target marketing in a, in a totally different way. And then that kind of, um, led me to actually working for on the agency side for a guerrilla marketing company in New York that I worked for, for a couple of years, um, doing like stuff, you know, kind of before, um, social media was a thing again. And before there were a lot of like terror threats, we used to do all kinds of stunts to get um, PR for companies. So we did like um, consumer electronics convention for uh, uh, a, a, a internet service provider, which I won't name because I'm an NDA with, but basically we like stormed the CES show with a bunch of girls in candy stripe outfits handing out suckers that say cable sucks. And we got kicked out immediately. Oh my but goodness. We had- you know, 200 girls in these cute little outfits. And it, it was like everyone was getting their phone out. Um, or I guess it was cameras at the time. There weren't really camera phones yet. Um, and we were all over the internet. Um, we were asked to come back by Microsoft the next day to like tour their house and stuff. Holy like crap. That. But just like doing stunts that would get attention, whether it was like Guinness World Records or like a flash mobs in Times Square or whatever. Um, things that we'd get arrested for often. Um, definitely were involved, like the company got involved in lots of lawsuits. Um, if you Google like top 10 guerrilla marketing campaigns or top 10 guerrilla, um, lawsuit campaigns, we, I was probably part of at least half of them. Wow. So I think like mafia wars, they got sued by, uh, 
by the city of San Francisco for doing these like um, fake dollar bills on the ground, but they were making so much money off of that campaign that they, we just kept doing it. <laughs> kept I remember doing- that. I remember that too. That's crazy. Um, yeah, so that obviously has given you a lot of skills towards what you're doing now. Um, and I wanted to ask you as well, how did you get into um, the the physical side of what you do? I mean, you, yeah. you, you train, you are a physical trainer now. Like how did you, how did that kind of come into your life? Yeah, fitness was always a thing. I was a junior Olympic volleyball player when I was growing up and, um, you know, played like, um, played up through those levels, didn't try to go to college for that um, because I wanted to really focus on actually like a career. A lot of my friends that stayed in, um, especially with like girls sports, you end up going to like division four schools and stuff um, and education is maybe not as good. So I chose not to go the college route or to continue that, but I did continue to stay somewhat in fitness by like, uh, you know, I was running marathons, doing things like that, but I had really lost my connection to like sport. And I really missed that because I, you know, grew up doing that, um, and being on teams and being with people. And so, um, when, after I left New York, after I, the economy was crashing, people weren't paying for like marketing campaigns quite as much. I decided to like dabble in PR because I wanted to, um, you know, sharpen my sword and have more experience. I went to work for a chamber of commerce as the director of communications. Um, and then that's where I met Tate. I interviewed him on the radio one day, um, for the chamber of commerce because his gym had just, um, joined the chamber and we did a ribbon cutting and he was like starting to, he was at that phase where he was phasing out of fighting and focusing on his businesses and like what was next. And so that's how I met him. And, um, he invited me to come in for a workout and I went into the gym and, um, we did fight gone bad, which is like, I don't know if anyone has done that. If anyone's in the CrossFit world, they'll know exactly what it is, but it's a, a rough, (laughs) rough workout. Um, and Tate didn't have a lot of, um, scalable equipment at the time. So I was probably doing things above my, um, strength, but I didn't also want to like look bad. I was trying to impress him. So I, um, you know, gave it my all and then I couldn't drive the car home afterward and thought like, God, this is really amazing. Whatever this is, I thought I was fit. And, um, and I was working out like many hours a day and I was doing this stuff, but in this like 30 minute workout, I was totally destroyed. Um, and so that got me like instantly hooked on doing CrossFit and like learning about, um, strength and conditioning from a different, um, standpoint. And at that time I was also coaching a junior Olympic volleyball team and doing their strength and conditioning. So I was learning those skills and kind of applying them to them and seeing them improve, seeing myself improve, and then really, um, feeling like I was connected to that like team sport community again, because you're doing, you know, fitness with other people. I wasn't just like at the gym by myself. Um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of how I got into back into that. And then when I decided to move out of New Mexico and, and to Los Angeles, part of that decision and not going back to New York was, uh, the CrossFit community was really cool and big out here. And I was really interested in that. And so I kind of did that as a hobby, then went into training for the CrossFit games in 2011, I believe. Ten um, on a team with CrossFit LA, and because of that, um, making it through regionals and making it into the games and doing that training, I got put in a bunch of places that had people that were working at different levels. Um, and there was a chiropractic group that was looking for a trainer and somebody with production experience and also training experience. And I just thought training was a hobby at the time. And uh, they talked me into interviewing for this job that I didn't really know what I was getting into. And I thought, well, I don't love what I'm doing right now. It was like award show season in um, LA. I had just worked a bunch of award shows and wasn't sure what I was going to do next. So I interviewed for it, ended up getting the job, um, thought I would do it for six months, ended up doing like five or six movies um, and staying on this like roller coaster for five years uh, with one of the largest action stars in any movie that he was involved with in the... uh, in the world. And so I got to work with a bunch of different people, um, and on a lot of really exciting action movies. And I got to apply my skills of, uh, you know, being in production and understanding like timelines and responsiveness and all that stuff and making things happen to, um, my, um, athletic skills and applying like strength and conditioning methods to, uh, getting somebody ready to do a stunt that had never been done before. So breaking down movements into different, 
movement patterns that were learnable and easier. And, um, and it was a really fun thing for me. And it turns out I was pretty good at it. (laughs) So I've been in that space now for seven years, um, and have worked with other people in other films and, um, have been kind of like all over the, all over the place. Um, currently helping out with like Jurassic world right now a little bit and, um, some other projects. So it's, it's a really fun, job there's a little bit of pressure but it's a lot of fun for me that's excellent speaking of jurassic world now uh, i saw one of your uh influencers is chris pratt is that is that how you got tied up with him yeah we saw him on the caveman site there the caveman coffee site. um yeah so tate was actually tate and keith were both in the original jurassic yep, world yep yep that's how that connection happened but Those then i guys. <laughs> <laughs> no they were good guys yeah they, they were, were they were good guys that's right yeah. um they're help, helping guys but <laughs> It sounds like this new one, there will be some bad guys, but, um, yeah. And then I got recruited through my, uh, uh, connections with people in the mission impossible franchise, uh, to help with Bryce who was getting ready because she also wanted to do some of her stunts and, um, she's been pretty vocal about me being around. So I feel okay mentioning her, but, um, yeah, that uh, we all saw that Snapchat video of you guys the other day. That was adorable. (laughs) Cats out of the bag, but yeah, I I had, I was very fortunate to get to work with her for about six months and, um, help her, you know, get ready for her project. And man, that was a lot of fun and that's happening right now. And there's still other things happening. So I'm still involved in that a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, you might see a few caveman type cameos in awesome. 2018 when that comes out. So that's very exciting. So yeah, we're very involved in that set from a bunch of different angles. That's awesome. That's I mean, so cool. what's really great about the both of you is that, you know, you have you both have great outlooks on life and you both have this ability to look at your life and just take that next step, that next that next turn in the road, you know, on that journey of which is life, you know, and 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 that's really refreshing and inspiring to hear about. And one thing that we always ask all of our guests on this podcast, and I'll start with you, Lacey. Um, with everything that you've done in your life leading up to Caveman Coffee and all of the cool things that you're doing outside of that as well, what fuels you to keep going and to keep uh, getting out there and and trying new things and, and, uh, you know, and and growing your business? I mean, for me, I've always, like, envisioned a life of, like, being able to work on different types of projects and being creative on those projects and, and all that stuff. And so Caveman and all these other things kind of fuel into that. And I in a weird way, like I never could have planned it, but all of the the history that I have and the experience that I have has like funneled into that, um, to making me ready for this time now and, and these businesses that we've created and these different things that are happening. And with Caveman, it's just fun. It's like, it's a really fun product. Like coffee is, you know, obviously the second largest traded commodity in the world. So people like it. It's not a hard sell. Um, and we have a great product, so it's, it's easy for me in that aspect where I'm not having to like really push it. It's just like, here's the thing. Let's see how far it can go again, you know, for a long time, because we didn't really intend to start a business. There was very little pressure. It was like, Oh, just try this and try this and cool. If it's working out, it's working out. It's not like, Oh my God, my paycheck's coming this way. Now it's a little more like that, but, um, and and other people rely on us for their paychecks. So of course we want to like build this business, but It's also, we're living in a world where uh, you're able to do whatever you want and create whatever you want and put whatever you want out there. And there's so many outlets and things that are new that are like worth exploring. And all of that really gets me like excited and jazzed and up on a Saturday night working. That's excellent. (laughs) That's so cool. And Tate, you seem to have a hand in everything from from acting to to the caveman business to to training, training with fighters and what what keeps you fueled what fuels you to keep on broadening your horizon and all these things um, i guess that i'm not super impressed with myself and maybe equal parts of self-loathing and wanting to be useful would maybe be an answer of some kind um yeah, I feel like I, I always look at like even if something goes really well, how it could be done better and how I can improve. And I try to stay in that space and reach higher. And it seems like um, to have the awareness of that, it becomes a responsibility to the people around me for me to be better than I want to be sometimes. And um 
And that's what kind of keeps me showing up is because I have an innate empathy to the universal fact that we need each other and I need to do my part. And I think that that's where growth, I guess, comes from for me. And that's what I feel like I need is that um, if I'm not, if I'm not scared about what I'm doing or I'm not, um, you know, the thing that you're doing that's going to be the most helpful isn't going to be easy to do and it's not going to be well-timed and you're going to have to go to your way. And it's like, so I've just kind of chosen a life that looks like that more and, and try to do something scary and push against myself. And I think it's all about an ego control thing to get and to be a master of yourself. And I guess that's what all these things are. And maybe that sounds crazy, but that's kind of how my mind is about it. You know, I never thought I could be. I remember when I was in high school and they said, yeah, none of you guys are going to have jobs like your parents had where you just have this one job for the rest of your life. And I thought, fuck, yeah. I was like relieved because I was like kind of ADD, I guess, about it all. Or it seemed like and it also seems like a horrific choice for people to tell you about to say, choose something. This is what you'll do forever. Like, holy fuck, man, that seems like a long time. And then you see how forever pans out for almost everybody around you. And you go, oh, that's not true. Maybe I'll just get as good as I can and be as purposeful as I can and live like that. And I think that that's the thing is, is uh, you know, you, I, I guess being a good steward and, and falling in love with the things that are interesting to me is the thing that's the responsibility. Because uh, yeah. I think that's the way of life. I think that's what it is, kind of. You you hit the nail on the head, man, Tate. Like, I mean, you are, I'll tell you right now, you're very inspiring to me. And um, saying stuff like that isn't crazy. That is some of the, the best advice that, you know, humans can give other humans is that you don't need to worry about the people around you or the things that are supposed to be laid out for your life. You only need to worry about being better than you were yesterday and, you know, bettering yourself. And that's what you, you did, I take away just from this conversation with you is, is like you have a, such a handle on that. And it's really, really awesome to hear. Well, self-loathing is something that I think that we all deal with. We all deal with that in some way. And there is a way to take a positive spin on it. There's two sides to every coin. Is it self-loathing or is it a need to be better? Yeah. You know, and I, I, I feel like you guys, both you guys hit that very well. Um, so is there anything big and awesome, any big news or any um, upcoming things for, for you guys in Caveman Coffee? You can see us at Paleo FX um, coming up soon. Hopefully you will see us in retail some spaces pretty soon. We're trying to, to take our ready-to-drink items into stores. And we have some delicious new things like emulsified MCT oil coming out that are, uh, you guys got to try some of it, I think, probably at um, the Southwest Coffee and Chocolate Festival. Yeah. But it's um, it's pretty awesome. It's a non-dairy creamer, um, and you get your, your hit of MCT for your brain and goodness as well. So we're excited to introduce those new products to the market and, and get them out to people. That is, um, that's excellent. Tate's going to be a comedian. Yeah, no I'm going to go up tonight and go and pee my pants in front of people <laughs> underneath lights. So I'm going to try that because it seems terrifying. That's awesome. Do you have like stuff written or are you just going to wing it? Stuff with all the fucking questions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous enough about this. Well, I, I hope there's video I've cameras because I want to see this. <laughs> there's a ton of people about it and uh, all these different things. And yeah, we'll see. I'll lay it out. I'll, I'll, I'm sh I'll talk I'm about it. I'll do it. my own. I'll do a podcast about it probably tomorrow. Um, I, you can hear on Pirate Life Radio how it all goes. But uh, it's been something I've been poking my finger at for a little while. And it's just one of those things. It's like. And then the self-loathing starts like, you fucking pussy. You got a big mouth. You talked about it a little bit. What are you going to do? You're going to do it. And like, this is my head talking to me. It's not the most fruitful way. It's not the way you should talk to your athletes. But sometimes, you know, you need, I, I think that whole thing, shaming works. You know, fuck fat people. You should be ashamed. Look at yourself. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I love this. Is, it, is, it, is that one of your jokes tonight? <laughs> I don't know if that'll fly. I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> That is awesome. I mean, that's, it's true. Get so disgusted with your shitty behaviors that don't serve you or anybody around you. Become so nauseatingly disgusted by that that it impacts change. Yeah. I mean, I don't see anybody that changes another way. Yeah. Then they do that first, and then they get the encouragement and inspiration from somebody. 
But without I, being completely disgusted with where you're at, you ain't changing directions. Yeah. And now we're going to teach people not to do that. Okay, that's some fat lady out in the Northwest somewhere that's saying, you shouldn't say that. To be, in the meanwhile, she's blubbering at 240 pounds, eating some Cheetos, talking about equal rights. <laughs> she doesn't know anything about even treating herself right. And it's like, that's the thing is like, I mean, my, my big overall thing in the, in the whole, like outside of the companies, outside of this and that is like, we need to be real and authentic. And that's not, you know, so let's really talk about like, if we really want to impact change and impart change in people's lives, what is useful? You know, how, how, how is, how is, how is that being honest or dishonest by saying we shouldn't say those things to me, that's being horrifically dishonest. And you don't get to address a problem if, you, if you're not going to come at it honestly. And I think that's what comedy is, is honesty. Yes. And so maybe people will hate it, but uh, I'll, have, I'll, it. Have, I'll have four. <laughs> I'm ready. That's awesome. I, I think that's great. And uh, finally, I just wanted to bring, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, obviously, everybody can follow you guys, uh, cavemancoffeeco.com. That's where uh, all of that awesome product is. But um, you both are into podcasting, which, you know, is awesome because we're on one right now. Um, you, you mentioned... This you mentioned pod- pirate these girls and they're all these hot super achiever girls that these four yentas get around and they just talk about <laughs> cocks and fucking uh, coffee <laughs> and being, being business bosses and how to dominate the world and fucking and uh, how to be a young lady and grow into a woman of, of some kind of stature and it's fucking pretty awesome and it's it's uh it's how many episodes have you guys got oh god i don't know i think we're probably we've done six months straight and we've released every week so yeah. we're yeah. um uh, we're excited about that it's called the grown-ass women's coffee club there it is and yep have a lot of fun and i don't really know i mean we actually do have a lot of male listeners so i don't i don't know why basically but, like a hundred percent males <laughs> no, <there> is- <laughs> Thick asses and blonde hair turn heads. I'm saying, <laughs> people listen. I'm the only blonde on there, but everyone is a good butt. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think um, it's a good one. Um, if there's any ladies out there listening, we uh, we get a lot of feedback that it's just like hanging out with your girlfriend. So hopefully it's funny and, and exciting, and we love feedback. So check and that out. And for dudes, you can get insight into women's minds. Yeah, exactly. Minds, You'll know which what's up. You're expected to know as a dude. It's yeah, the you, worst thing. You you're expected know. to you know, should but should know. But how would you, you know? You know. You never get to be on a gossip session. You right? Now it's your opportunity. Grown-ass woman's coffee yeah, club. Right. There it yeah, is. The thing, the thing I like about your guys' podcast is that um, you take feminism to where it should be, where, where it's it's it, it makes more sense. I, I really well, like what you guys talk about. Pirate Life Radio. <laughs> that's, that's my number one goal. And I think I hit the park most of the time. <laughs> oh, man. And then there's the other side, which is Pirate Life Radio. No, thank you for that. Um, we, have, we have a lot of fun, and you're probably one of our few listeners, but... Um, yeah, uh, Tate also has a podcast, which is widely listened to, uh, huh. getting like, you know, 100,000 downloads versus our 1,500 or whatever we get. But um, it's not a yeah, contest. Yeah, it is a contest. Oh. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. No, he's killing it and, uh, and has some really amazing guests on there. So if you haven't listened to Power Life Radio, like last sure. week, I had I had this guest. What was it myself? <laughs> it was just me talking for 15 minutes. It was minutes. just him. <laughs> <laughs> I'd listen to it. In fact, I do. I listen to both of yours, and I think they're great. Um, it's great to have more podcasters out there, and it's great to have more people in coffee, like we said at the beginning of this. Thank you both so much for taking the time to talk to us. This was amazing. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, man. Look forward to seeing you guys again. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And we'll obviously be in touch for all sorts of different things. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, the world's our oyster. It's gonna be It's going to be a great ride. Yeah, awesome. Right on, man. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Deathwish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.